Now we are well along in our study of the book of Revelation, having arrived at the last three chapters, chapter 20, 21, 22. The horrors of the tribulation are past, our study of the great uh, negative truth of the worldly, and now we come to the golden age of mankind, astrologists, and spoken of by the Greek philosophers. We come to the perfect age of mankind, which man longs to bring in, and this is the golden age of Pericles, the Republic of Plato, the 1,000-year Reich, Third Reich of Adolf Hitler, and of course this is God's fulfillment of the dream dreamt by Darwin and Martin Luther King, Jr. Of course, the Holy Spirit's version of Little Luther King had a dream, and the writer of Jeremiah tells us that the prophet that had the dream, let him speak a dream, what's the chaff to the wheat, is not my word like a hammer. Martin Luther King, Jr.'s dream of a great passive mongrel uh, United Nations doesn't come to pass. If it comes to pass at all, it is fulfilled in the tribulation under the Antichrist. You may notice our remarks on the leopard from Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 2. Darwin's great dream of man's uh, pilgrim to progress, pilgrim's progress, puddle to paradise, ever upward and onward to a final stage where humanity realizes itself and is proud to be called man, to quote Franklin Delano Roosevelt, never comes to pass. As a matter of fact, every plan of man in the realm of sociology, psychology, physiology, geopolitics, and religion is turned into a desolation. And less than 24 hours after Jesus Christ arrives, men learn that the answer is a sinless, holy creator ruling and reigning over their individual lives, and religion have absolutely nothing to offer at all. And the total result of the work of unregenerate man for 19 centuries is nullified and made nugatory in less than 24 hours. After all, the issue was spiritual to start with, and the findings of physical science couldn't have affected it one way or another. Revelation chapter 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Nor are we left in any doubt about what these things mean. If the Bible is symbolical or figurative at all, or speaks in symbols, it is careful to tell us what the symbol refers to. For example, we are referred to chains of darkness, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. We are referred to the key of David in uh, Revelation chapter 3. There are all kinds of keys, there are all kinds of chains. And since the Bible is its own dictionary and its own interpreter, we never have to rely on the depraved guesses of church politicians and Greek scholars for the correct meaning of the words. This is plainly an unusual type of chain and an unusual type of key. The bottomless pit we have discussed before in our comments in Revelation 9. And he laid hold on the dragon. We've discussed him in detail in our comments on Revelation 12 that old serpent which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. This brings in what we call the mill annum, the millennium. There are three beliefs in regard to the mill annum, the millennium. The first of these is called post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is the teaching that man is gradually evolving up from an amoeba, and by availing himself of the sacraments and the findings of science and education, he can gradually make the earth a better place to live upon, and by balancing the economic system and leveling classes to a common mongrel denominator, he can bring in peace on earth and a thousand years of perfect peace before Jesus Christ comes back. This is a belief of Christians called post-millennialism. Of course, Darwin and Huxley and Marx didn't count on Jesus Christ as a deciding factor or even a, a calculated risk. But if a man's a Christian and a post-millennialist, that's what he believes. The creed of the post-millennialist is stated best in the Southern Baptist Convention pamphlet called the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. And if you have a copy of that, you may look under the article called The Kingdom of God. And you'll see immediately that the official creed of the Southern Baptist Convention is post-millennialism, ubiquity, and it is the philosophical system of Plato and Augustine who wrote The City of God, and it is just about as close to the biblical truth as a used car lot resembles a rose garden. There were many, many Christians who were post-millennialists until World War I. World War I kind of knocked the props out of the Darwinian evolutionists for a while. Of course, they recovered. Their ability to recover is remarkable because of their faith. 
Uh, an evolutionist must have much more faith than a Bible-believing Christian. And the faith of evolutionists to believe in evolution in spite of evidence is of the 20th century. It's really remarkable, if not downright fantastic, to quote the current expression. Uh, it's a fantasy. And so the post millennialists kind of had the post taken away from them after the Battle of the Marne and the Argonne Forest and the Treaty of Versailles. And so they became what we call our millennialists. An our millennialist is a person who simply doesn't believe there's going to be any thousand year reign of Christ. Instead of saying that man's going to bring in a peaceful kingdom for a thousand years and then Christ shall return, the our millennialist simply looks for things to get better or worse depending upon the point of view. And then the Lord suddenly comes back and blows everything up, and the white throne judgment takes place. The leading amillennialist of the centuries, of course, was John Calvin. And the Presbyterian theologians, Warfield, J. Gresham Machen, Macon, or Machen, whatever you want to call him, and others followed this amillennial system. Robert Dick Wilson, a great conservative Orthodox Christian and a master of more than 26 languages, never knew enough Bible to get it straightened out and is quite characteristic of the geniuses and the linguists and etymologists such as Franz Delich and Jacinius, Kyle, Lightfoot, Westcott and Hort, Ellicott, Trench, Vincent, and the men who wrote the Greek lexicons. It's quite uh, SOP, standard operating procedure, for these men to be incapable of understanding the Word of God. So nearly all of them are post-millennial or amillennial. And amillennialist simply believes a thousand years spoken of here in our context are figurative and represent, quote, an indefinite period of time. The fact that the expression is used six times, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, the fact that the expression is used six times without a single variation means absolutely nothing to the amillennial Bible rejecter at all. Most of the reformers were amillennialists. And those who weren't were post-millennialists. There were a few pre-millennialists in the group. And, of course, there's no time to go into that now. But if you'll obtain a copy of the written copy of the Bible Believer's Commentary and Revelation, you'll find in the introduction, the preface, the history of premillennialism given. Now, what is a premillennialist? A premillennialist is a man that believes that Darwin was full of beans, that Aldous Huxley was full of baloney, and that Haeckel and Lamarck were stuffed full of demons up to their ears. That is, a premillennialist is a realist. A premillennialist is a man that believes there's going to be de de degeneration, devolution, and disintegration, moral, social, and economic chaos, with the world and falling apart, and only able to unite itself under a man from outer space who will be the devil incarnate. And that following this degeneration and catastrophe, Jesus Christ himself will return, and there will be absolutely no peace on this earth whatsoever until the Prince of Peace comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and fulfills the promise given to him at his birth, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The reading toward men of goodwill in the corrupt New American Standard Version is a copy of the Dewey Reams Roman Catholic Vulgate of 1582. And you're not to believe it for a minute. The Bible of 1582 was a Dark Age Bible put out by Jesuit priests, and the fact that the American Standard Version copies the reading means nothing except the men who recommend the American Standard Version are either remarkably ignorant or remarkably crooked, or perhaps both. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he'll set up a 1,000-year reign. Now, this is the pre-millennial system. Every leading soul winner from 1900 to the present recording is a pre-millennialist. The world has not seen one post-millennial or amillennial revivalist or evangelistic soul winner since the turn of the century. And with the exception of a few holdovers like B.H. Carroll, and Scarborough. They all died out in World War I. No man who takes the same Christian approach to the Scripture could possibly believe the theory of evolution applies to man's moral and spiritual progress. If there's one thing the Bible teaches from kiver to kiver, as they say up in North Carolina, 
It teaches that man is hopeless unless God haps him. You hap them in North Carolina, you hope them in Kentucky and Missouri, and you hep them if you're from Alabama and Mississippi, and you help them if you're from Colorado or Kansas. But unless God helps them, they go to pieces. The book of Judges is an historic record of this great moral truth, the great law of human collapse. Every dispensation of the Bible ends with apostasy, and the one you're living in is no exception. The premillennial view, therefore, is the realistic view. It is the view of the realist who prepares himself for battle, who arms himself with the teeth, and doesn't pay any attention at all to anybody's blather about peace on earth. There isn't going to be any till the king of priests and the prince of priests, the king of glory and the lord of lords returns, and until that time, in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. Revelation 20, verse 3 and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Of course, this puts the post-millennialist and the amillennialist in a ridiculous position. And the only way they can get out is talk about Christ binding the devil's power at Calvary, and overcoming the principalities and powers, Colossians 2, and leading death and hell captive, Ephesians chapter 4. And of course, all of this is just blithering nonsense. The captives led captive in Ephesians chapter 4 were Old Testament saints in paradise, not death and hell. When Christ had the keys of death and hell around his girdle, he had control of death and hell. He didn't capture either because death is still here and the last enemy to be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15 is death and it is no more destroyed until the end of the millennium than garbage and cancer. Therefore, the spiritualization tendency, the spiritualizing tendencies of the amillennial and postmillennial exegetes and expositors is uh, phenomenal in its uh, fantastic ravings. Nothing could be any further from the truth if you tried. And Christ conquering the devil, his triumph over the devil, was plainly a spiritual victory in Colossians chapter 2, which is apparent by the context. If you think the devil was chained and shut up at Calvary, you ought to go down and see a head shrinker. Like an old saint said when a post millennialist talked to her, she said, well, if the devil's bound, you mean he's bound now and he's been bound since the resurrection of Christ? And the post millennialist said, yes. And she said, well, he sure do have a long chain. And there's, a lot, there's more truth in fiction than that, brother. That isn't just a smart saying, you know, like, the King James Bible is good enough for Paul and Silas and it's good enough for me. You know, that old hackneyed cliche used by these Bible perverts. Now, that, there's a lot of truth in that. If he's bound with a chain, he sure has a leash on him, doesn't he? He sure has some slack. No, the post-millennial systems and our millennial systems are obviously attempts by Satan himself to overthrow the Word of God. The devil's not bound. He's on the loose. Simon Peter says he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he walks to and fro in this earth, brother, in the book of Job before the crucifixion and after the resurrection in 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you think he's bound, you ought to have your head looked at. What do you think the instructions are in Ephesians 6 for spiritual warfare if your adversary is chained? Your adversary is not chained, but he's going to be. And then he said, he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be loosed, and after that he must be loosed a little season. This loosing takes place in verse 7, 8, and 9. And it's one of the wonders of the Bible and one of the great uh, mysteries which causes many people to reject the literal account of the book of Revelation. They say, well, it just, just doesn't make sense. Years ago in Alexandria, Egypt, at the great apostate dead orthodox school, the great educational institution that had a reputation of being fundamental because it stood by the fundamentals of the faith, there was a demon-possessed scholar named Origen. And Origen, of course, uh, invented the text from which the American Standard Version is taken and the New American Standard Version. And this Origen had a ha habit he followed, uh, which may be stated thusly. If it doesn't make sense and it isn't reasonable, there has been a corruption of the text. And on this basis, Origen altered the text in hundreds of places. I don't know whether you know it or not, but there are more than 5,000 changes in the Greek text of the King James Bible and the New American Standard Version. 
The New American Standard Version of 1960 is a reproduction of Jerome's Latin Vulgate from 1582, preserved in the Reims edition. And if you get a copy of this, you'll see it. And throughout this Bible, so-called, you will find wherever it didn't make sense to the translator, he simply changed the reading. Now, here we have a case. People say, well, why would the Lord allow the devil to come out again and mess up everybody after he's been defeated and put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years? But you see, these type of questions come from a shallow mind that is not seeking truth. These questions are the questions that come from a mind that has been trained in casuistry and sophistry, a mind that has not been trained in sincerity and deep meditation. Any man who meditated deeply on the problem and sought an answer from the Scripture would understand perfectly why the devil is loosed. You see, for centuries, men have been blaming things on the devil. Now we realize, of course, you have a certain type of uh, materialist, a certain type of uh, social evolutionist who doesn't recognize the presence of the devil, but many of the educated people from this class are now Satan worshipers. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but all the leaders in the movement out in California that are Satanists are PhDs. And every one of them was an evolutionary materialist in the college where he taught. That is the obvious reaction against a gross materialism, an evolutionism, which uh, is prevalent in Russia, is Satanism. Man has to have an authority, he has to have some spiritual authority, and if he won't take the right one, he'll invent one or get the wrong one. So for years, men have been blaming things the devil. The devil has a point. Don't you think for a minute that he's not brilliant? Don't you think for a minute that he's not rational? In our studies in Revelation chapter 12, we learn that outside of the Trinity, he was the most powerful, intelligent personage in the entire universe, and not even the Lord Jesus Christ could rebuke the devil before the incarnation. You may review those marks in the volume that deals with Revelation 12, verse 3 to 8. Now, this personage has his point before the judge advocate, and his point is this. These men have blamed this on me. They blamed that on me. Why, if you took me off the scene where I couldn't tempt them and couldn't work on them, they'd still mess up. And on this point, the devil is right. His grounds of argument are legal and correct. With Satan gone off the face of this earth, with the unclean spirits removed from the land, see Zechariah 9, 10, 11, and 12, man's depraved Adamic nature still causes him to reject Christ, Isaiah chapter 26, resent Christ, Psalm 110, and refuse to worship Christ, Zechariah chapter 14. On this earth, surviving the tribulation, are hundreds of people who escaped in holes and caves and rocks and escaped the mark of the beast and at the same time were not converted to Jesus Christ. They go into the tribulation and then on into the millennium. Also on this earth, according to Daniel chapter 11, are countries that get through the wrath of Satan without being caught and being converted. And then in addition to these, we have the blessed of my Father inheriting the kingdom prepared from them for them from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. And when these come into the millennium, they bear children, Isaiah chapter 65. These children grow up, grow up and have other children. So in the millennium, you have two or three generations coming up that still have the inheritance of Adam, the Adamic nature. Since there is no such thing as a new birth after the rapture, and review our marks from the Holy Spirit, back in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Since there is no such thing as an indwelling Christ spiritually circumcised in the soul from the body in the millennium, these people grow up obeying Christ only as a matter of form, ritual, and regulation. The regulations under which they live are found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which see. And notice again, how remarkably, again, how remarkably the Holy Spirit has placed the verses so that if a man rejects salvation by grace through faith, he automatically picks the salvation by works passages that are for people in the millennium. As we have commented before in our comments on uh, Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 14, 
the combination of faith and works found in the tribulation is reduced to works in the millennium. And no reader of Matthew 25 and Matthew 5, 6, and 7 could ever confound that plan of salvation with the one given in Ephesians 2, Galatians 1, and Romans 3, 4, and 5. It is a works situation. With the devil gone and man living entirely under the law, works. Read them. Study them. They're in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount gives the constitution for the literal, physical, visible, Davidic, messianic kingdom. And they're the reason why the Seventh-day Adventists picked the pasture in Matthew 5 and why the Catholics picked the Our Father out of Matthew 6 and the reason why the liberal picked the blessed are the blessed this and the blessed that out of Matthew chapter 5 is because these people like all grace rejecting, grace denying, grace hating, self-righteous, God defying, salvation rejecting sinners want a plan of salvation in which they have a part. In the millennium you'll have a part. Matter of fact you'll have the part, the whole part, nothing but the part. In the millennium, if you may call a man a fool, you're in danger of judgment, brother. You're in danger of going to hell if you call a man a fool in the millennium. Didn't you ever read Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Didn't you ever notice that was given to Jewish disciples? Did you ever notice that no Christians are present? Didn't you ever notice the plan of salvation is not in the passage? Didn't you notice that blood atonement is not mentioned except in the altar at Jerusalem like it will be in the millennium in Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48? Haven't you studied yet to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth right not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? So the devil's point is man is inherently corrupt and he'll fail even without me around. And it's true, he does with a glorified risen Savior on hand as King and Lord of Lords, with an earth blossoming and flowering out into vegetation like the world has never seen, with the light of the sun and moon increased seven times, man is still a rebel. Here on this regenerated earth, Matthew chapter 19, where the restitution of all things has taken place, Acts chapter 3, live together in peace and harmony, Isaiah chapter 11, man still resents a holy, sinless being who is superior to him. And at the end of the millennium, men rebel. They rebel. Now returning again to the millennium itself and the nature of this reign. In verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his bark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. You will notice it is not an indefinite period of time. It is 1,000 years. You will notice they are seated on thrones, plural. They are not in heaven. You will notice they are seated on the ground, on the earth, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 40, you will notice throughout everywhere it is always speaking of a literal, physical, visible, politic kingdom on the ground. Not once is there any reference at all to heavenly reign. They lived and reigned with Christ. It doesn't say they died and went up there in glory and reigned. They lived and reigned. And Paul says if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And Paul says if we suffer with him, we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Someday we get this millennial inheritance, and the Holy Spirit leads us to no doubt at all as to the nature of this inheritance. For he says in Colossians, knowing of the Lord Jesus, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Unlike salvation, which is by grace through faith, the millennial inheritance is an earned reward that is earned by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall study the nature of this servitude, the nature of this reward, and the nature of this reign on the reverse side of this record, side two of this volume, dealing with the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20 at verse 4. A study of Revelation chapter 20 dealing with the millennial reign of Christ. And of course this word millennium comes from the Latin millennium, 1,000 years. 
And on the reverse side of this record, we have discussed in detail the three views of the millennial kingdom, the post-millennial view, the amillennial view, and the pre-millennial view. And, of course, that is the issue in America today. I say it's the issue, it's not the uh, ultimate issue. The ultimate issue in America today among God's people is the authority of the word. And when the average conservative speaks of the authority of the word, he is referring to a mythological book that he doesn't have, that nobody's ever seen, and to which he has no access. When we speak about the authority of the word, we are speaking of the Bible we have in our hand. Next to this issue, the issue of the infallible authority of God's word, is the issue of the second coming of Christ. And the reason for this is we're living in the last quarter of the last half of the world's history before the advent. And so this issue becomes a crucial one. It becomes especially crucial in view of the fact that communism is an evolutionary system that teaches progress by revolution and automatic progress by conflict. Of course, the Bible picture is automatic degeneration whether you conflict or not. And therefore, the second coming of Christ is not merely a religious issue, it is a social and political issue. And this makes it very appropriate for our time, or as the country folks say, very timely. We read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that two classes of people reign with Christ. We read about the people sitting and reigning with Christ, spoken of in Matthew 19, 25, like the twelve apostles. We, of course, uh, read about the reigning of people with Christ, like the Christians do from the church age who suffer with Christ. For Paul says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And then we read about the tribulation saints reigning. Notice the colon after the word them, and the second group follows, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Now these people were decapitated, as we discussed in our exposition of Revelation 6. And at that time, in discussing Revelation 6, the souls under the altar, and at the time we expounded Revelation chapter 11, verse 4 to verse 10, I called your attention to the fact that the method of capital punishment used in the tribulation is decapitation. And so we read here, they were beheaded. They had their heads cut off for not taking the mark of the beast. And they live and reign with Christ. Now, if there's any doubt in the student's mind about this literal reign, he should ve give very careful attention to the material found in Luke chapter 19. For here we are told in no uncertain terms that this reign has to be on earth, for the people who reign do not reign over New Jerusalem, nor do they reign in heaven. They reign over literal cities. You will notice in Luke chapter 19, when Christ returns, having received the kingdom, verse 12, that his Christ-rejecting citizens, verse 14, who didn't want him to reign over them, are sent into outer darkness and slain, verse 26 and 27, but the faithful servants who suffered with Christ and were faithful have authority over C-I-T-I-E-S cities, Luke 19, 17, Luke 19, 19. Now this should erase all shadow of a doubt in anybody's mind as to the nature of the millennial reign. There is something, certainly nothing spiritual about it. The people who are given authority are given authority over cities on this earth when Christ returns and puts his feet on the ground. Nothing could be any clearer, nothing could be any plainer, and the gross, crass spiritism of the allegorizing, figurativizing, Bible-rejecting scholars which deny a physical literal reign is very typical of Bible-rejecting infidels. Now, the greatest criticism brought against the premillennialist is that he's a gross, crass materialist. But strangely enough, this charge is always brought by men who think they are reigning now. And instead of carrying their crosses, they're trying to wear their crown in this dispensation. It is one of the paradoxes of the Almighty to confound a man and slap the words back in his mouth. And the most gross, carnal materialists in this age are the ones who are not looking forward for Christ coming to set up a literal kingdom. As a matter of fact, the greatest materialists in this age 
are the ones who don't believe he's ever coming back to set up a kingdom. So they are doing it themselves. That's how the Lord makes fools out of people. The spiritual people in this age, as in any age, are the people who are trying to win people to Christ to hasten the return of the Lord so the literal, political, visible kingdom can be set up. But this is very typical of the confusion that people get into when they try to alter the Word of God and make it suit their own fancy. The everlasting fable that the Jew rejected Christ because he was looking for a visible kingdom when Christ came to bring a spiritual kingdom should be classed with uh, Alice in Wonderland, Aesop's Fables, Charlie Peanut, uh, Brown, and Lil Abner. Uh, every Jew had a perfect right to expect a literal kingdom to come, and when the disciples said that Jesus will about this time restore again the kingdom of Israel, he didn't deny that he would. All he said was, it isn't time yet, you don't know the times, get busy. Christ never denied there'd be a literal kingdom restored to Israel. Why, when he was born, the angel said to Mary, the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. Not God's throne, David's throne. And the angel said to Mary, He shall reign over the house of Jacob, not the church, not the spiritual Israel, not the Israel of God, Jacob, brother, the old circumcised son of Abraham and Isaac. All right, the millennium takes place. We read in verse 5, The rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. They are kings and priests. They are said to be priests, and they are said to reign. Therefore they are kings and priests. And there's not much doubt about the literalness of this passage. For Revelation 5.10 says, Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign, not in heaven, not in the kingdom of God. We shall reign on the E-A-R-T-H, earth. And now you see where Judge Rutherford and Russell got off. They thought the tribulation was now taking place, and since the Bible said they'd reign on earth, they figured they'd just endure and last through the tribulation and come out in the millennium. <laughs> and they might at that. The only trouble is the Antichrist is going to show up in the meantime, and... You're going to have to get that mark. 144,000 were marked. How are you going to tell one mark from another, brother? If I were you, I'd put that watchtower down and pick up a Bible. All right, this is the great and glorious reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. With the second advent of the true king, the king of righteousness, five things take place that science has been trying to bring in for 3,000 years. First of all, the physical surface of the earth is regenerated. The earth is literally born again. Matthew 19, 28, Acts 3, 20 to 21. Animal nature is liberated from the curse, and nature itself grows four crops a year while all the animals live in perfect, peaceful integration. Romans 8, 18 to 25, Isaiah 11, 1 to 11, Amos 9, 13, Isaiah 55, 12, Isaiah 30, 23, Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, Joel 2, 19 and 24, Ezekiel 34, 25 to 26, Ezekiel 36, 29. You see, the one who created creatures and who nurtured nature certainly has no trouble in making them obey him. Next, the Gentile world powers are obliterated, and the armies and navies of America, Europe, Asia, and Africa are demolished. See Daniel 2, Micah 4, 3, Isaiah 2, 4, Revelation 2.27, Revelation 11.15, Revelation 12.5, and Revelation 19.15. The Christians who suffered in this age and went outside the camp bearing his reproach come into their inheritance as heirs. 2 Timothy 2.12, Romans 8.17. And they inherit a spiritual moral kingdom of righteousness, 1 Corinthians 6.9, Galatians 5.21. Israel, as in Solomon's time, now becomes the chief and head of the nations, and the world capital becomes the holy, righteous Jerusalem with a sinless Savior as king. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, Isaiah 63 to 67, Hosea 2, 14 to 23. And the Jew inherits the kingdom of heaven in answer to his prayer of Matthew 6, 10. What summit conferences, 
League of Nations, five-year plans, heart funds, Salvation Armies, YMCA's Catholic Welfare, Socialized Medicine, Medicare, Atomic Energy, Positive Thinking, the FBI, Military Conscription, Truces and Law Courts could not attain in 2,000 years of church history the Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes at once the day he lands on this earth. And vanished is all the glory of this world with all its heroes. And gone from the memory of mankind are the deeds and pageants of its great men. For in view of the results of this kingdom which now comes, the world's leaders are proved to be what they really were all along, cheap humanitarian hucksters with nothing more in mind than proving their own righteousness or trying to atone for their own sins with the filthy rags of their own good works. The Jew gets put back in the lead, head of the nations. The one true holy apostolic Catholic Church is annihilated along with its corrupt Vatican politics, and the Christian receives the reward for his own good works, having obtained the gift of God's grace by unmerited, undeserved, unearned eternal life. And with these three groups properly placed, the Christian, the Jew, and Rome, peace comes at last for 1,000 years, the longest period in human history. I don't know whether you know it or not, but 15 wars have been fought since the turn of the century, and the two biggest and three biggest are yet ahead, as I said a little while back. And it's the first time in the history of mankind there's been peace for this long a time. Women can sleep without worrying about having to pack their household belongings and lugging their children away from the path of an approaching army. The 88, the 105, the 155, 205, and 20 millimeter shells, and the heavy and light mortar shells rust in the ordnance depots. The bows and arrows rot in the rain. The 38s, 45s, 30-06s, 3030s, 380s, and 7 millimeters gather dust in the drawers and the gun racks while men talk about the king at Jerusalem who had been given all power in heaven, kingdom of God, and on earth, kingdom of heaven. Now he says, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This clearly shows you that there are two resurrections. These two resurrections are called the resurrection of the quick and the resurrection of the dead in 1 Peter. Paul speaks about them in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. And, of course, Daniel speaks of them when he speaks about the dead and those that are sleeping in the dust, awakening. And when they awake, they come up at two different times, separated by a thousand years. Hence, Daniel says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, first resurrection, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, second resurrection. Now, once again, the man who is post-millennial or amillennial cannot discern between the two resurrections. For if a man is a post-millennialist and believes that we're bringing in the kingdom, he has a thousand years of perfect peace on this earth, and then Christ returns to one general resurrection and one general judgment. If a man is an amillennialist, he believes things get worse and worse until Christ comes back, and then there's one general resurrection with one general judgment. Now, of course, this destroys two-thirds of the Bible. If there's anything the Bible is clear on, it's clear that on the fact that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And if you read the passages in Mark, Luke, and Matthew in the book of Acts, you'll find the thing that puzzled the disciples was Christ speaking about rising from the dead. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were grieved in the book of Acts because the disciples spoke of the resurrection from the dead. Nobody had any objection to a resurrection. Paul says in his defense before Agrippa that the Pharisees uh, all agreed there'd be a resurrection from the dead, or of the dead, and he said that uh, that was the hope of Israel, a resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. But uh, a Pharisee didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead. As a matter of fact, the resurrection from the dead was unheard of until Christ rose from the dead, and when the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned it, to his disciples, they had a great disputation among themselves as to what these things should mean. Everybody understood there'd be a general resurrection and a general rising of the dead at the last day. But in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, when Christ said, Tell no man what things you've seen. 
till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Mark says they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. You see, unsaved people don't know there are two resurrections, and their rejection of the doctrine of the two resurrections shows that consciously or subconsciously they have rejected Christ as Savior. For when Christ arose, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says a half a dozen times he arose from the dead. From the dead. From the dead. His resurrection from the dead shows that you can be resurrected before the dead come up. And this was the bone of contention between Martha and Mary at the death of Lazarus. If you remember, Martha was troubled about with many things and cumbered with much serving, and she never did get her doctrine straightened out. And she said, Lord, I know it. he'll rise again at the last day, speaking of a general resurrection and a general judgment. And Christ had to correct her and bring her into line with the premillennial biblical teaching of Bible-believing fundamentalists. When he told Martha, he said, I am the resurrection. Don't you see what he was telling her? She said, I know my brother's coming up at the last day. And he said, Martha, you haven't got that right. If you'd spent as much time studying your Bible as you'd spent studying A.T. Robertson and J. Gresham Mockin and Warfield and other dead Orthodox conservatives, you'd know perfectly well your brother's not going to come up at the last day. Because if a man believes on me, he's coming up before the last day. Did Jesus Christ come up at the last judgment? Did Jesus Christ come up at the general resurrection? Well, if he rose from the dead, and he's your Savior, and the Spirit that raised him from the dead dwelleth in your mortal bodies, Romans chapter 8, what is to prevent you from coming up before the last resurrection of the unsaved dead? Nothing. Brother, you're coming up. Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. The resurrection from the dead is the first resurrection. And as we have noted earlier in our comments on Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the first resurrection is not over until Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. This is why he said, this is the first resurrection. And if you will review our remarks on Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, you will notice that one man was delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh because he taught the first resurrection was spiritual. And, of course, this is the teaching of the majority of dead Orthodox apostates in America today. They teach the first resurrection is the one of Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. But this is plainly the spiritual resurrection of the believer. What we are dealing with here is a literal resurrection. Notice the context. Those who were beheaded lived and reigned with Christ. There is no reference to a spiritually dead sinner being quickened by the Holy Spirit and reigning with Christ in the kingdom of God. Why, that's nonsense. These people had their heads cut off and they came back up out of the grave and lived again and sat out on thrones and that completed the first resurrection. The first resurrection has three parts to it, as we've said before marked by the three feasts of Deuteronomy 16, 16. These three parts are the first fruits, Old Testament saints, Ephesians 4, Matthew 27, church age saints, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, gleanings or tribulation saints, Matthew 24, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 14. Now we've discussed these matters before in our comments on the expression, come up hither, found in Revelation chapter 4, and the sincere student of truth who desires the truth should review these remarks if he can obtain the volumes. In closing our exposition of our passage on this side of our volume, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, we note the Holy Spirit has said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death, mentioned in verse 14, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Then if a man is in the first resurrection, he doesn't have to worry about the second one. 
A man of the second resurrection has to worry about whether or not his name is in the book of life. Those in the first resurrection don't have to even examine it. Paul said, Your names are written in heaven, Philippians chapter 4. Christ said, They're written in heaven, Luke chapter 10. And these names written in heaven of saved people in this age refer to people who are just like Jesus Christ at the rapture, Ephesians chapter 5, Philippians chapter 2, 1 John chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And these people have already reigned on this earth as Christ a thousand years before the last general resurrection of the unsaved dead takes place. They have no more a fear of going to hell at the last judgment than a full-grown man should be afraid of a penny balloon. John said, Perfect love casteth out fear, for fear hath torment. He that feareth hath not made perfect in love. Here may we have boldness in the day of judgment, for as he is, so are we in this world. And by the time we reign with Jesus Christ on this earth for a thousand years, the second resurrection will be nothing to us but a chance to judge with Christ. Daniel chapter 7. You will notice in that passage in Daniel chapter 7 that while thousands are standing before the fiery throne to be judged, there are thousands thousands judging with Christ. This doctrine is confirmed also in the New Testament where we read in 1 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, that the saints shall judge angels. Furthermore, Paul says what? Know ye not that ye shall judge the world? In plain words, the Christian at the white throne judgment has already been a perfect replica of Jesus Christ, conformed to his image, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30, for more than a thousand years, and his official capacity at that time will be of a joint judge with Christ of the world and fallen angels. Now, we'll get into that more as we study on through Revelation chapter 20, and especially when we deal with the events that take place at the white throne judgment, the last judgment of the unsaved dead, which is the general resurrection and general judgment that you hear have spoken of so much by the dead orthodox commentators. Suffice it at this time to note that if you're saved and a child of God, you do not come up at the last resurrection on the day of judgment. You come up at least 1,000 years before this time, and you come up in time to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and attend the marriage of the Lamb before the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ begins. Therefore, at a minimum, I say at a minimum, there are a 1,000 years between your rapture and the white throne judgment. The maximum is not given. For the rapture could be this instant while I'm talking, there is a chance that I might not ever finish these volumes and our study in Revelation. There's a chance before I get to our next volume, volume 14, the Lord may come, and this may be the last volume in which you'll ever hear my voice. The maximum time is not given. We know that Daniel's 70th week intervenes between the rapture and the millennium. But we do not know the measurement of time that intervenes between the rapture and Daniel's 70th week. Therefore, the rapture is always imminent. No matter how long the advent may be delayed or timed, the rapture is imminent and can occur at any time. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. I hope when he comes back, you'll be caught up with him to meet your loved ones in the air, in the clouds going up. And I hope you'll experience the joyful and blessed fulfillment of that verse that says, I am the resurrection. He that liveth and believeth on me shall never die, referring to the saint who's alive when he comes. And though he were dead, yet shall he live. How? Easy. He's resurrected from the dead, exactly as Jesus Christ arose from the dead the third day. We'll continue our study of Revelation chapter 20 in our next volume, which will be volume 14. This is side one of volume 14 in our study in the book of Revelation, side one. Volume 14, picking up our commentary 
in Revelation chapter 20 at verse 7. Now we have talked about the matters that follow the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as he returns to this earth. And it is very essential for the Christian and especially the devout student of the Word of God to understand that during the millennium people are born and people die. Furthermore, it is very essential that the Christian understand that the people who go into the millennium from the tribulation, and see our remarks on the previous volume, volume 13, are not all converted, nor are all their children converted. The Adamic nature is still there, and although they live by the Sermon on the Mount, they live under a rule of iron, and this is abundantly clear from the many times this matter is mentioned. The nature of the millennium is not at all like some fundamental scholars present it. The nature of the millennium is a military dictatorship, and one must never forget this. As a matter of fact, there are punishments put out in the millennium for people who call people fools, and these punishments far exceed the punishment given out today for murder. There are punishments given out in the tribulation for people who refuse to observe the Feast of Tabernacles, which far exceed punishments given out today for stealing automobiles. So one must never forget that the nature of the millennium is a military dictatorship. Observe also that the Feast of Tabernacles is kept, sacrifices are made at the altar, Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48, and nearly all the Old Testament system of uh, Levitical laws comes back into effect. Now this is very confounding for the modern expositors, and you will find very little among the works of uh, Gabeline, Pettengill, uh, Schofield, uh, English, and McLean and others on the nature of this millennial worship. Clarence Larkin has perhaps the best presentation, and of course since his work was dated 1909, anything you find about it that resembles his work was copied from his work in 1909. Clarence Larkin, incidentally, is one of the great premillennial expositors, and a man uh, whose name is mentioned just as little as possible in fundamental premillennial circles. Nearly everything that Dr. DeHaan and Theodore Epps and Charles Fuller ever learned about the second coming of Christ, they learned from Clarence Larkin. And Clarence Larkin is one of those peculiar writers that everybody buys and everybody reads and nobody talks about. It's a very unusual phenomena. I have never been in a major uh, preacher this generation. I've never been in the office or the study of a major preacher that didn't have a copy somewhere in his library of Clarence Larkin's dispensational truth. But I have been many, of, been many of the highly denominational groups where this book was carefully secreted on the bottom shelf under a pile of magazines. Now, Larkin has the approach correct, and for those who cannot understand the return of the uh, Levitical rules and regulations, he should give himself some hours of study in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. Perhaps the most outstanding case of this uh, befuddlement among the modern conservatives is their comments on Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Here we are told that the holy days and new moons and Sabbaths are a shadow of things to come. And to my knowledge, there isn't one commentator, there isn't one expositor, there isn't one major commentary on the market today, nor any written since 185 A.D. that even believes the passage. Every one of them insists that these were shadows of things to come, but the statement said they are shadows of things to come. The Greek verb is in the present tense. And here we learn one of the great uh, funnyisms about Greek scholars. Those who holler the most about tense systems and verb endings and noun endings and declension and conjugation never fail to violate the laws of freshman grammar where the Bible crosses their theological and doctrinal opinions. The perfect examples are Colossians 2.8, where the word he is has been inserted by every major translator since 1880, when it appears in no Greek text. And the reading that these things, the holy days and the new moon and the Sabbaths, were a shadow of things that were fulfilled at the first advent. Of course, that isn't what the Greek says or the English. And the student who desires to learn the Word of God should take knowledge and take note immediately that whenever a man goes to the Greek to change the English, 
He does so because of a doctrinal bias he has ahead of time that prevents him from understanding the Word of God. These things were not a shadow of things that were fulfilled at the first coming. They are a shadow of things to come. And these things will be observed not only in the millennium, but horror of horrors, they are observed after the millennium is over for a period of a thousand generations. Study Isaiah 66 and notice the light given on this subject and the excruciating revelation given by the King James text that no Hebrew scholar could possibly find with any manuscript or any set of aids in any language. We must never forget that the Holy Spirit himself is the teacher and the guide and the instructor when one is seeking the truth. Never be so foolish as to think because a man is an etymologist or a linguist and has linguistic ability that he has any ability to understand anything in the Bible. The greatest Greek scholars that ever lived were not premillennial. That is, the greatest Greek scholars who ever lived couldn't understand the Bible as well as a ten-year-old child in a daily vacation Bible school. Don't ever forget that. And the fact that some Greek scholars today are premillennial mean little or nothing. They didn't get their premillennialism from the men who taught them. The grammarians and the lexicons are not written by premillennialists. And the books by Trenson, uh, uh, Vincent and Trench and Moulton and Milligan and Souter and Westcott and Hort and Ellicott and Rendell and Lightfoot are not written by Bible-believing men. They couldn't understand the simplest truths of the Word of God. All right, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, at the end of the millennium, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And we discuss this matter under Revelation 20, verse 1. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, uh, the famous group mentioned back in Ezekiel chapter 38, 2, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. There are three interpretations on the work of Gog and Magog. The first of these interpretations teaches that this refers to a battle which will be fought before the rapture. James McGinley espoused this interpretation. The standard interpretation is that Ezekiel 38 and 39 refer to the battle of Armageddon at the second coming of Christ. There is a third interpretation which teaches that the battle referred to in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a battle that takes place in the middle of the tribulation, eliminating Russia and putting Rome in the driver's seat. A very close scrutiny of the passages, however, will reveal that two different battles are being referred to. The one in chapter 38 is the reference to the one here, when Israel has been dwelling peaceably in safety. The one in Ezekiel chapter 39 refers to one fought before the millennium because there are seven months burying the bones, seven years doing this and that, which is apparent by the context. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God of heaven and devoured them. This is the last attempt of Satan to eradicate the Jewish nation. This perennial eternal hatred for the Jewish race, which we have discussed under Revelation chapter 12, reaches its final fulfillment in the passage before us, where the last battle takes place. This is a suicidal measure in the last agony of desperation. For the original plan was to use the earth as a base of operations from which to populate outer space. If you will recall the archaic efforts of the space astronauts way back in the 1970s. Satan's final effort then is a mock heroic and futile gesture. It is an admission of defeat. Still swinging as he goes down, the fifth cherub is determined to land a haymaker to God's authority if it can be done at all. And there's no use wasting time in this chapter for a broad layout on the field or an extensive plan of attack. The capital is there. The head and king of the government is there with it. And this is the king whom Satan met on the Mount of Temptation in Matthew 4, in the Judgment Hall in Matthew 26, on the cross, Matthew 27, in the heart of the earth, Ephesians 4, 4 to 12. And this king has been the only hitch in the plan that prevented the cherub from taking over the earth. At Jerusalem, the preparations were made to the Gatha race, which would take the place of the sons of God, whom Satan trusted would help him exalt his throne above the Almighty and populate outer space with a Darwinian anthropoid monkey. And now everything is gone and ruined. 
The only forces Satan can muster for this last battle are flesh and blood human beings who will have to fight against a supernatural, sinless Savior who has all power in heaven and earth. And gone is Satan's church, his heavenly cohorts, his dictators and Caesars, his popes and Medicare, his socialization, his crowns, his kingdoms, and his universities. And in one last pell-mell hell for election Banzai charge, Satan moves his forces front, rear, and both flanks to surround the holy city. He knows when he starts, the game is lost, but men will still listen to him and go to perdition with him. Don't forget, in the millennium, men are still at Damak, and the battle is over in a matter of minutes. Verse 9 says, Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And that's it. You say, is that all? That's all, brother? There isn't any more. The wage of sin is death. And the last great battle is the shortest one fought in the history of mankind. It ends and signs forever a truce of peace to the war that was declared in Genesis 3.15. The enmity ceases in Revelation 20, verse 9. The time for judgment has come. The wars are all over. And the only problem is what to do with the prisoners and the booty. If you're praying for peace on earth, your prayer is going to be answered. And your prayer is going to be answered by the disintegration of the elements in fire. The answer to the world's problems is not integration and it is not segregation. It is disintegration. Notice when the fire comes down, verse 11 says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. The solution to man's problem is simple. Annihilation. And that'll do it. And the nihilist has a point, although his point is miscarried in his philosophy and his sociology. God himself, the ultimate creator, is the ultimate destroyer. He commissions to one of his exalted beings the job of death and calls him Abaddon, Apollyon, destroyer. But when it comes to real destruction, you haven't seen anything until you see the Lord Almighty at work. And beside him, the devil is small pickings when it comes to destruction. And when the Lord blows off his water bomb, it'll be a water bomb, not a cobalt bomb, as I've often mentioned the last 20 years. The heavens and earth, the heavens and earth, melt with a fervent heat. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And Simon Peter says, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. In plain of words, the Lord is going to burn it up. You don't have to worry about man blowing it up. We hear a lot of panic today about the atom bomb. It's kind of like the panic about uh, tobacco and e ecology and that kind of business. You see, the government can't uh, break the South financially till they get their tobacco crop. And the government can't break the South educationally till they ruin their educational system. And the South's the only place where the money's left. The state governments of the big states up north have been bankrupt, many of them, for years. And you see all this nonsense about, well, a sudden atomic attack uh, wiping out the human race. It's nonsense. Uh, you have at least three wars in the future that are going to be fought, so don't get in a sweat about it. And, of course, all that business is to get control of your property and your land under the uh, title of an emergency bill. You must remember, whenever the one unsaved world hollers, wolf, 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 there's never any wolf there. When the Bible-believing prophet cries, wolf, he's in the door and eating up your children. And that's the difference. The real danger, when it's pointed out, is derided by unsaved people as gloom, negativism, anti-social, warmonger, hate monger, fascist, etc. And then they holler about something else that has no bearing on the problem at all. All this fuss about air pollution. Why don't you know what's behind that? Government control over your industries. You ought to have better sense than to be able to be fooled by a thing like that. And listen, when the Lord finally blows that thing up, brother, he's going to blow it. You don't have to worry about man setting off a string of chain reactions that'll explode the atomic stockpiles. Why, you idiot, read your Bible. 
It'll come out like the Bible says, not like you think it will or like some other fellow you read who's all upset. You know what you better worry about right now? You have better worry about getting left behind at the rapture and worshiping the beast. Do you see the difference? The world is hollering, air pollution, women's emancipation, women's liberation, birth control, ecology, revolution. Why, those aren't issues. If you solved every one of them, you'd still burn in hell. If you solved every one of them, the Lord would come and leave you here to worship the Antichrist. You're a fool to believe that kind of stuff that you read in Life and Look magazine. You just haven't got good sense. When the Lord blows it, brother, it blows. You don't have to worry about SAC or retaliatory missiles retaliating for a retaliatory missile uh, flung to retaliate for a retaliatory missile. You don't have to worry about that. When the Lord blows her, brother, she blows. The solar system disintegrates. Out goes the sun, out goes Jupiter, out goes Venus, out goes Mars, up goes this Earth in a sheet of flame and an atomic explosion that make a 15 megaton cobalt bomb sound like a penny ladyfinger firecracker going off under a basket. And I saw a great white throne of him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And the devil, verse 10, that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Did you notice this is the lake of fire in which the unsaved man is told to depart? Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for, prepared for, not for man, prepared for the devil and his angels. If you go to hell, you'll be a misfit. You'll be in the eternal madhouse of the universe, an everlasting misfit, misplaced, expatriated, lost. And that's why we use the term lost. It's one of the most forlorn terms in the English language. There are other words like unloved. There are other words like alone. There are other words like forsaken. But all of these words can be summed up in one word, lost, lost forever, out of place, misfit, no togetherness, no belonging. If you die unsaved without Jesus Christ, you go to a place that wasn't even made for you. God has prepared a place for you with himself. And like an old catechism said, the chief end and purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy his presence forever. And if you wind up in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels, Dave Garner said, who would you blame? Why, you'd blame yourself. Don't let some little smart mouth, dope-headed comedian talk you out or laugh you out of that business. Garner used to say, well, if you went by the best you could and followed your conscience and wound up in hell, who would you blame? Well, you'd blame yourself, you fool. You blame yourself for rejecting light. You say, well, you went for the light you had. You didn't go by the light you had. Any man that goes by the light he has winds up at Calvary. Didn't you know that? Didn't you read Romans 2, Romans 3? Why, you rejected the Bible to start with, you old Bible rejecter. What made you fancy you were seeking for truth? The greatest teacher that ever lived by all standards of pedagogy said, Thy word is truth. Did you expect to find the truth in Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Mohammedism, Rosicrucianism, all that business? By neglecting your Bible? You're a little prejudiced, aren't you? If you go, you go where the devil and the beast and the false prophet are, and the statement says they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. We have talked about this eternal judgment. Back there in Revelation chapter 14, see our volume that has in it the comments on Revelation 14, verse 9, 10, and 11. Now this brings us to the great general resurrection and general judgment of which we hear so much about in the Heidelberg and Westminster Catechism, the Articles of Faith and the uh, Articles of the Church of England, the 39 Articles. All unsaved professing Christians believe in a general resurrection and general judgment. All the great confessional creeds of the Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and Roman Catholic communions profess to believe in a general resurrection and a general judgment. It is true with the modern secularized, secularized Christianity that the average church member today doesn't believe anything except the Sermon on the Mount the Lord's Prayer, and the Golden Rule. 
And of course, these uh, are verses taken out of context from pre-crucifixion passages and misapplied to unsaved people. Very typical of Bible study these days. And yet these great churches to which these people attend have confessional standards to which the membership is supposed to adhere. Now, of course, we know this is nonsense. After all, if the universities that train the preachers for these pulpits have no confessional standards of doctrine, how in the name of heaven can you expect the membership that sits in the pews to have any? In Gallup polls taken time and time again through the last 30 years, we learn that the teachers who are training the ministers for the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, and Lutheran pulpits and the other groups have themselves rejected more than nine-tenths of the Bible. Many of them have rejected more than that. Many of them have rejected 99.9999% of the Bible. And some of them, well, many of them, many of them have clearly stated they don't believe in the virgin birth, they don't believe in the bodily resurrection, they don't believe in a literal heaven or a literal hell. Well, if the leadership in the church is trained by such men, do you expect the constituents of that denomination to have any convictions? Why, of course not. Therefore, when they talk about believing in a general resurrection, a general judgment, it's really a moot point. Some of them believe it, some don't. But again, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar, and the fact that you don't believe it will not influence the course of events in the least. The writer says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This is not the judgment seat of Christ, where the Christian is rewarded for his works and is saved so as by fire if his works don't survive. This is not the place where a man appears who's been saved by grace through faith. This is a place where tribulation and millennium saints appear whose names are in the book of life and where the lost from the tribulation, the millennium, the church age, and the Old Testament appear to receive their due reward. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, the old Adamic, Noahic, people that rejected Noah's message, up they come, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Out they come from Adam right on to the end, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the last final judgment. This is the great terror of the modern educator or liberal. This is the great truthful doctrine of the consummation of the ages in all times, ending in total degeneration, total collapse, and total disintegration. And this is the end to which every major educator in America today is scared to death of and becomes sick and faint at heart when he reads it, and gasp like a crippled man for some crutch to lean upon, and as these frightened cowards teach our young people, our universities today, they take science for a crutch in one hand, and philosophy for a crutch in the other, and fearing for their very lives, they hobble along like the weak cowards they are, trying to escape the truth, and lead their constituents to the same place. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. The man who avoids this obvious ending of the course of human nature and denies it and flees from it is obviously a soft, unrealistic man who is not fit to lead anybody anywhere. If you're not prepared and able and looking forward to having the secrets of your heart judged and God bringing you into work, uh, bringing you into judgment with every secret work, whether it be good or evil, you're still a coward running from the truth. And for you to talk about a Bible-believing Christian leaning on the Bible as a crutch is just a little too much for some of us folks that have better sense than you do. The great crutches are science and philosophy, 1 Timothy 6.20, Colossians 2.8. And the greatest cowards in the world are the religious liberals and international socialists today that are trying to bring in heaven and earth because they don't believe the revelation of God. The revelation of God speaks of no heaven on this earth until Christ comes, then only a temporary heaven for a thousand years, and then total disintegration. That's God's great solution for air pollution. <laughs>
And, of course, again, this is a negative note, so it is rejected by the man who takes a positive view of his own fallen nature. Now, on the reverse side of this record, we'll take up a detailed discussion of this white throne judgment, this last judgment of the unsaved dead, the most horrific and terrific thing that will ever take place in the history of man before eternity begins. This is the last judgment of the unsaved dead, for every secret thing is brought out in the open, and where the words of Christ are fulfilled, who said, For every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For there is nothing hid that shall not be uncovered, nothing done in a secret that shall not be known. I hope you're prepared to pass such a test. To my knowledge, there is no religion in the world that offers any permanent security or covering from such an exposure. As a matter of fact, the only thing that will solve it is the sinner hiding himself in the person and work of a sinless man whose thoughts, motives, and works could stand the all-seeing eye of a holy God. Now we come to one of those apart and these appalling negative catastrophes but this one here is the final one of the appalling things that accompany the depravity of man and the humus of human nature, that, or as they say out in the country, this ties the rag on the bush. And of course, the army had an expression for it, which I'll not repeat. But as we've said before, if there's one clear lesson of the total depravity of man and the absolute helplessness of man to do anything constructive upon intervention from God himself, now, when I say I'm not referring to the Calvinistic view of Arthur Dabney Mill, but I'm referring to the inability of art from divine help. Absolutely impossible. And if there's one clear lesson the Bible teaches, the entire theory behind modern education and science is a lie. The theory that man is progressing and evolving and moving upward is a... And if there's one lesson the Bible teaches above all others, if every dispensation ends in creation, ends in apostasy, from the founding of this earth to the new heavens and new earth, where man is able to turn it into anything but a maelstrom and a magpie's nest and a smorgasbord of hate, terror, lying, stealing, passion, passion, lust, and apostasy. And now the final calamity takes place. The Bible says that for every idle work thereof in the day of judgment, and this day of judgment is spoken of again and again to the Bible, and this is what is commonly referred to in denominational periodicals as the general resurrection, the general judgment. Now, as we've seen in our study of Revelation chapter 20, the such thing as a general resurrection and general judgment, this is a mythologi mythological legend passed down from one uh, seminary camp fire to another, but there is a final reckoning following the 1,000-year reign of Christ, and this is spoken of many, many times in the Scripture. For example, in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly of the unjust unto the day of judgment. Again, verse 4, about the fallen angels, they are reserved unto, Peter chapter 3, verse 7, But the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment of judgment. And this great day is mentioned over and over again. Or as the old song says, there's a great day coming. There's a great day coming. Are you ready for that judgment day? Daniel 7, 9 says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The definite article. The judgment was set. And the books, and the books, and the books were opened. This is the great day when the books are opened and the ledger is checked. This is the day, great day of reckoning and reevaluation and uh, checking over the stock. This is the great inventory. This is the day when the greatest in internal revenue agent of all comes by and checks the books. And Revelation 20, verse 12 says, I saw the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, 
not the Christians, and the dead, not the nations, and the dead, not the saved people from this age, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. <clears throat> that is, if you're going to count on works to save you, you will save dead. If you're in this age and so foolish and so wicked and so willfully ignorant of the Word of God and so lazy and indifferent and so carnal and covetousness and proud and self-righteous and stupid that you listen to any of the cults that are teaching salvation by works, then, my friend, you'll have to be stand, you'll have to stand and be judged according to your works. And the Bible says of Satan's ministers who teach this doctrine in this age, their end shall be according to their works. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11 to 13. In this age, by the works of the law shall no man be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In this age, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul said, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Let's get it straight. You are not one of the twelve tribes of Israel in the tribulation under the Antichrist, being fed by manna while you're hiding out in a sail of peace. So don't put on airs about the Sabbath. You are not a Gentile in the millennium coming up to Jerusalem three times a year to see the King of Hosts on the throne at Jerusalem, a Gentile whose country must pay homage to a living Savior in the Davidic throne or receive the plagues of Zechariah 14. So don't pull a sermon on the mount on me and don't you pull on God, you old carnal, proud, self-righteous, hell-bound rascal. You better get on your knees someplace and say, God be merciful and be a sinner. You're living in the greatest period of the long-suffering of God the world has ever seen. You're living in a day and age when God has spared and spared and spared this world and spared it longer than he spared the world of Noah and has spared it for the sake of his son. And brother, when this one's over, she's over. If you want to get saved by grace through faith, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And when these things come to pass of which you are reading, the Bible says God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And my God, my God, what a judgment this is going to be. And when I say my God, my God, I'm not speaking in vanity or facetiously or taking the name of the Lord my God in vain. You'll hear some my gods in that day. You'll hear more my God in that day than you ever heard hitting the beach at Anzio or the beach at Cherbourg or the invasion of Anyweetok and Saipan and Tarawa and Okinawa and Iwo Jima, when the infantryman is reduced finally uh, to his last few words and his vocabulary has been reduced to two words, do you know what those words are? Those words are, oh God, and my God, my God. And when a man gets down there, there's nothing else left to say. And I tell you the truth, brother, in the day when the heavens and earth pass away and the earth melts with a fervent heat, and you find yourself sun suddenly standing unsupported in outer space, you see, you probably fail to notice that there is no technical rising of the dead. There's a resurrection, but they only come up from graves and from death and from hell. They don't rise up through the heavens like you do at the first resurrection because the heavens and earth pass away and the elements melt with a fervent heat. This means, my dear fellow, and I don't give two hoots what your background is. I've dealt with Roman Catholic priests and bishops. I've dealt with Seventh-day Adventists and Mormon elders and Campbellite preachers. I have spent time critiquing the books that were used by your teachers. And I could care less about your personal feelings about the matter. The fact that you may be a 32nd degree Mason or some big shot in the town where you live, the fact that I may be addressing at this moment a banker or a doctor or a lawyer couldn't mean any less to me, bud, because as God is my witness and as God's truth will be here when heaven and earth shall pass away, you're going to find yourself, sonny boy, standing out there in outer space with nothing under your feet. 
your car gone, your motorboat gone, your airplane gone, your bank account gone, your stock holdings gone, your clientele gone, your patients gone, no record of your degrees, no record of you, your humanitarian efforts to defend uh, the downtrodden and save the oppressed masses, and out you'll be there, bud, standing before a holy almighty God whose brilliance outshines the sun shining in his strength, and the books are open, and you'll give an account. You won't give it to me. You'll give it to him. And you won't give account to a God who is just merciful and all understanding. You see, the God many of you worship is a lopsided God. He's a moral pervert. And you fancy that because the French say to know all is to forgive all, that if God knows everything, he'll have to automatically forgive. But you see, you've been living by the precepts of depraved, fallen mankind. And the holiness, purity, and righteousness of a sinless God is a foreign theme to your education. But you'll find out. Psalm 90 speaks of these matters in verse 8. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. How about that? Paul says in Romans chapter 2, in the day that God shall judge the secrets, the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Job says there is no shadow of darkness where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. The Lord Jesus Christ said, for every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account there in the day of judgment. David said, O Lord, thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Psalm 139. Thou understandest my thought afar off, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. That is, if the Bible record is correct, when I say it, I say it with no doubt in my own mind. If the Bible record is correct, God knows every thought you've ever had, He's seen every place you ever put your hand, and you've never been in a nightclub or a cabaret where the lights were low enough and the smoke heavy enough and the music loud enough to cover your secret sins. The Lord said to Jeremiah, Mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. You don't hide things from God. And the biggest trick that Engels and Marx and Darwin and Tolstoy and de Maupassant, Hemingway, Schopenhauer, Carlyle, Nietzsche, Tufelsdrake, Leibniz, and all that bunch, and Horace Mann, yes, Horace Mann, and Giovanni Gentile, and Sikas, and the National Education Association ever pull on this country. The biggest boner they ever pulled in this country was to convince this country, especially the young people in this country, that God didn't have enough sense to know what they were doing. Well, let me tell you something. If that book is right, you never had a thought pass through your mind that wasn't engraved in God's library in heaven. And when the books are open, you're going to get a three-dimensional cinemascope in full color with stereo sound played back where the universe can see what kind of a man you are. And let me tell you something, sir, madam. If you're a big enough self-righteous hypocritical fool to think that your life could pass the examination of even your neighbor in such a light, you're crazy. If you'll pardon my plain English. You're a sick man or a sick woman. If a stereophonic, cinemascope, three-dimensional color film were made of every thought that's passed through your mind and your imagination in the last 20 years, if every secret motive and thought of yours was brought out into broad daylight and judged publicly, you couldn't pass a test given by your children or your mother. And what makes you think you're going to bamboozle the Almighty? David said in 1 Chronicles 28, The Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. 
If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. My, what a day, brother, what a day, what a day that will be. Then you'll see who only is righteous. Paul says, in that day the thoughts of the heart shall be made manifest. Then shall every man have praise of God. Paul speaks about the Christian uh, having to war a spiritual warfare, to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against uh, God and bring it into captivity and obedience to Christ. In that day you'll see Mark Twain stand up and give account for his practical atheism. In that day you'll see Emmett Fox and Emily Caddy, who taught unity and Unitarianism, stand up and give account for their godless blasphemy. In that day you'll see John Dewey stand up there and give his account for undertaking to be an educator at Columbia University when his dying word scribbled on his uh, desk by his own pen said the only truth was man could know nothing. You'll see Carl Sandburg get up and give an account for his railing on the ministry of Billy Sunday. You'll see Alfred Lord Tennyson get up and give account of his deism. You'll see Thackeray and Russell and Humes and Moliere and Cellini and H.G. Wells and Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe give account. Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen Foster for their drunken rejection of the Word of God. Tom Anatole France, O. Heinrich Heine and Van Loon and Hugo and Tarkington, Tolstoy, Dumas and Homer. You'll see the great writers of this world who competed with the Word of God and tried to overthrow the Word of God and try to raise up imitations of the Word of God. Get up and give account why they tried to set themselves up as authority over the living Word of the living God. In that day, Rabelais and Balzac will give account for their smutty pornographic literature, which was the forerunner of the work by Hugh Hefner and Joe Fletcher and some of the Situation Ethics boys. You'll see them. You'll see them in all their glory. You'll see Charlemagne, Napoleon, Abraham Lincoln, and George Washington, Jane Mansfield, and uh, Clark Gable, and Errol Flynn as the Lord knew them. And you'll see Walter Ruther and Pope Johnny and Cardinal Spellman and Fulton Sheen as the Lord knew them. And you'll see yourself as the Lord sees you for a change instead of the view you've been getting through your own eyes or the eyes of your social crowd or the eyes of your friends and relatives. Brother, you're going to be weighed in the balances. And you may not be wanting in the eyes of your family and friends, your relatives and business associates. Maybe you're not wanting according to the standards of these world's apostate religious systems. But oh, what a day that'll be when you'll be judged by that man whom God hath ordained and given all men assurance everywhere in that he hath raised him from the dead. What a day that'll be when you'll be put in the scales and balanced not alongside me, a sinner like yourself, or like some poor, depraved punk like Buddha, or Lao Tse, or Mao Tse, or Confucius, or some epileptic like Muhammad. Wait till you get weighed in the balance with a man who never had to clear his throat, who never had to correct a mistake, who had no need to ask forgiveness from anybody and who never had to confess one sin during his life on this earth. We'll see then, won't we? Yes, we will. And that day you'll see him stand up. You'll see Spinoza with his rejection of the Old Testament, Santayana with his rejection of the virgin birth of Christ, Mike Chiavelli with his power of politics. You'll see A.J. Cronin and Lloyd Douglas and Luther Weigel in their true light, Christ rejecting, God defying, Bible-denying sinners. You'll see Darwin up there in his monkey suit trying to get his tail unhung out of a bush someplace. You'll see Voltaire and Rousseau, the atheist, who laughed at the Word of God. You'll see Nietzsche and Charlotte Bront and Steinbeck and Cooper and Jack London and Kipling and Swag and Whiteman and Hemingway and O'Neill and Hobbes and James Joyce and Wiley and Spencer Goldsmith and H.D. Lawrence and Sinclair Lewis and Dos Passos and Thomas Wolfe and Henry James and John James and James Jones and Norman Mailer stand up there and give account. Give account. Time's up. Where is Norman Mailer? Gone to judgment. Where's the mailboy? Gone to judgment. Where's the milkman? Gone to judgment. What happened to old Lyndon Johnson? He's gone. Where's he gone? He's gone to judgment. 
Where are they? I don't find anybody around here. What happened to Paulette Goddard? Gone to judgment. Whatever became of old Eisenhower at the judgment? Where's Patton? Where's General Lee? Where's General Jackson? Gone to judgment. Listen, there are only two judgments you can stand before. If you're saved and you're a child of God, you go up at the first resurrection and stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and you're judged according to your works as a Christian for your service for Christ after you're saved. And we covered that matter very thoroughly in our comments on Revelation chapter 19. And if you're not a child of God, wash in the blood covered with the perfect righteousness of a sinless man imputed to you by grace apart from works, you will stand with the tribulation and millennial saints before the white throne judgment. And in this age, a Christ rejecter doesn't have his name in the book of life. And when the books are opened, not a trace of your record will be there. The old song says, The moral man came to the judgment. His self-righteous rags would not do. The men who had crucified Jesus had passed off as moral men too. The soul that neglected salvation, not tonight I'll get saved by and by. No time now to think of salvation. At last they had found time to die. And oh, as the lost were told of their fate, they cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. You say, Brother Ruck, when you trying to scare me? Yes, sir, I'm trying to scare the H E L L out of you. And some of you don't have enough sense to be scared. The Bible said Noah moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. The Bible says save others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. The old song says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. An old song they used to sing says, There was a time on earth when in the books of heaven an old account was standing of sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went up to the keeper <coughs> and settled it long ago. Long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. The old account was large and growing every day. For I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw the pain and woe, I said that I would settle. And I settled it long ago. On the 14th of March, 1949, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I settled my account. My loans were called in. And I paid my bill. I paid it with somebody else's money. I had no money of my own. I was bankrupt. I couldn't even borrow, let alone steal. I had to beg. <laughs> the Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and like blind Bartimaeus sitting by the highway waiting for a handout, I was there when Jesus passed by and said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And if I remember correctly, blind Bartimaeus cast away his garments and came to Jesus. Is your debt paid? Who paid it? When was it paid? How much was owed? Have you got the receipt? Have you got the canceled check? Let's see it, banker, lawyer, doctor. Let me see the canceled check. Show it to me. I'm not from Missouri, but near there. Show it to me. I've got the canceled check in my hand. You want to hear what it says on it? The check I have in my hand says, it says, Be it known unto you men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, whereby you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him for righteousness. For God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
I don't have to worry about fearing at this judgment. For John says, Perfect love casteth out fear, for fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But he says, We Christians who believe what God says and have the cancel receipt, we don't have to worry about fear. For as he is, so are we in this world. Herein is our love made perfect, 1 John 4, 17, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, I hope you'll get saved today. As we conclude our 14th album on the book of Revelation, I hope it concludes for you with a settlement of accounts with God. And on that great day, may you stand sinless, faultless, blameless, conformed to the image of His Son, unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Father, bless this short and brief dissertation on Your great white throne judgment. And may I have the joy and privilege of standing up there with Thee someday in judgment, judging, and see others around that have been saved through this short exposition of your living word. And I ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake and glory, amen and amen.